I always wished that I had invested earlier in Google, Amazon, Netflix, Spotify, all of these really early tech stocks. Maybe the next biggest thing is right in front of me and I didn't realise it all along. Maybe Bitcoin could be the next dot-com boom. And we might see some Amazons and Netflix and Teslas come out of the woodwork in the crypto world. Bitcoin is the oldest and biggest digital crypto going so far, and it was created by an unknown Elias named as Satoshi Nakamoto. Bitcoin could reach over $100,000 in the future, and we have no idea the potential that this could have around the world. Will Bitcoin flop? Is it a hype or is it here to stay? And it could be the next massive thing all around the world that can completely change the way that currencies work around the world. We just don't know yet, it's too early. One thing is for sure, Bitcoin is in a massive hype bubble. But the question is, what is Bitcoin really worth? In this video, we're going to explore the history of Bitcoin and its rise to stardom, where it all came from and where it could be heading in the future. The crypto market now accounts for a total market cap of over 2.1 trillion dollars. That is incredible. To compare this, Apple have a market cap of 2.2 trillion dollars. They are so, so close. However, Bitcoin on its own hit a 1 trillion market cap faster than Apple, Google, Amazon, or any of the big tech companies. To put this into perspective, Microsoft took 44 years to hit a 1 trillion market cap. Apple took 42 years. Amazon took a staggering 24 years. Google 21 years, and Bitcoin in just 12 years. Since the birth of Bitcoin, there have been tons of altcoins flooding the market, which now account for around 40% of the entire cryptocurrency market with over 9,000 different cryptocurrencies around and available that you can buy and invest into. Some of the main types of altcoins these days make up mining based ones, stable coins, utility tokens and security coins. Ethereum and Binance coins are the second and third largest altcoins on the market with huge, huge, huge market caps as of March 2021 and this is changing every single day. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name's Matt, I work for a bank by day, I invest in property on the side and on this channel we explore all things money, finance and property investing to help people lead a more financially savvy life. We're building an amazing community of finance nerds here on YouTube, so don't forget to hit the like button for the almighty YouTube algorithm. And if you like the channel, then please subscribe and join the community. On the 18th of August 2008, the domain bitcoin.org was registered. Later that year, on October the 31st, a paper appeared under the name of Satoshi Nakamoto, and this paper was labelled Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash payments, and this was sent to a cryptographic mailing list. This paper detailed a peer-to-peer -peer network that had never been seen before, that didn't rely on the trust of a central network, government, or bank. And on the 3rd of January 2009, Bitcoin came into existence with the Genesis block, otherwise known as Block Zero, being mined by the infamous Satoshi Nakamoto with a reward of 50 Bitcoins. This is what kickstarted Bitcoin. The difference is that transactions are made with no middlemen, which means no banks. Today, Bitcoin can help you buy a hotel on Expedia, you can buy furniture on Overstock, or you can use it in the Xbox store. But much of the hype is by getting rich by trading Bitcoin. It's already rose to stardom once in 2017, where Bitcoin hit around $20,000 before crashing all the way back down again. And now in 2021, it's happening all over again. But the question is, is it a bubble or is it here to stay? And is it going to keep climbing to the moon? So Bitcoin was the very first cryptocurrency into the market. Hence, it had the lead and the head start amongst all of the other altcoins there on the market. So there's still going to be a time to go to see whether Bitcoin will remain at the top of the market. As well as being able to use Bitcoin to buy merchandise, international payments are a huge advantage of Bitcoin. Because it's not one single currency, it's a globalized universal currency. It means that one person in one country can pay Bitcoin to somebody in another country country and it both has the same value. But with over one trillion dollars of value in Bitcoin, is it really worth it? Well, when you look at the stats, Bitcoin has been increasing year on year over the past few years. However, it's hit a point recently where it's not really going above 10 million payments a month. Now that does sound like a lot, but it's not a lot when you think about all around the world. So the question is, is Bitcoin starting to stall? But what is Bitcoin and cryptocurrency? Well, just like using a normal bank account, you don't actually need to know the ins and outs of how the whole Bitcoin and crypto system works. Just like when you're getting a bank account for a normal bank, you don't need to know how the entire financial system works in your country. However, Bitcoin is built using what is known as blockchain. And in the blockchain, there are multiple points of information. Each block stores the from, 
to and the amount in the transaction as well as a few bit of extra bits of information. It has a hash that's associated with the block and then if anything is changed within the block this completely changes the hash and this is how you start to add the security layer. This stops anyone sending fraudulent blocks in the blockchain that aren't correct because therefore the hash is then incorrect. It also stores the value and the hash of the previous block which means if you throw off one block it's going to throw off the entire chain and that's how Bitcoin remains so secure because this information that's stored is distributed across the entire Bitcoin network that everybody has access to. Therefore, everyone has the same single truth. However, if anyone tries to manipulate that, it's very obvious and it'll be rejected straight away. Blockchain in itself is really interesting technology that can be completely separated from the cryptocurrency world. Using blockchain is a great way to digitally sign and secure and prove that a particular digital asset is unique. And that's being used right now with NFTs known as non-fungible tokens. What this is, you'll see that artists online are selling all of their artwork, whether that's infamous memes, Twitter selling their very first tweet, they can sell that. But the big question is, well, what's stopping you from copying a file and creating a brand new JPEG? Well, the difference is blockchain, because here you can digitally sign that particular image with a unique code to prove that you own the original, just like an original piece of artwork. And we're now seeing pieces of digital art sell for millions and millions of pounds because people can prove that they have the original on their device because of the blockchain. And as well as payments and digital art, blockchain could also be used in, for example, ideas like medical records, paying your taxes, different government documentation. There are so many different formats that you can use blockchain to protect and secure data and prove that what you see digitally is the original or the true copy. Imagine purchasing a house and doing that using blockchain and that proof is there for everyone to see, which makes it a very secure method. The next major point to mention is that Bitcoin is fully virtual. It's a cashless currency that doesn't actually exist in the real world, which means that you can't trade coins and notes in Bitcoin. And instead, all of these transactions happen digitally on the centralized and distributed ledger. There are, however, debates where the cashless societies and digital currencies are really beneficial for society. Digital currencies and cashless societies can create a huge problem. With the virus hitting this year, we saw loads of businesses all go to cashless because they don't want to be handling loads of money because money, coins and notes are covered in bacteria and filth. And with more of a society going to the digital transactions and going cashless, it means that it's harder for crime, for money laundering and all of the negative sides of money and finance. In theory, it should lead to less crime overall. But interestingly with Bitcoin, for the first part of Bitcoin's life, that has hasn't been true and I'll cover that later in the video. You also have to consider the vulnerable people of society who may be financially excluded. This could be somebody who's homeless, who can't get access to a bank account. It might be somebody who hasn't quite got the right visa documentation after moving to a particular country and therefore they can't open a bank account yet. And by going completely digital and cashless, it means that these people may be financially excluded from society. And it also comes with data privacy concerns. With more of our information and more of our lives going digital, it means that the more information there is stored online, the easier it is for that information to land into malicious hands. But the reality is that if Bitcoin did go mainstream, long gone are the days of going down to the markets and bartering with cash because everything is now digital. It also means that you can't pay that dodgy builder in cash who might not be claiming his own taxes because everything would be auditable and visible on the central ledger. The next big thing to know about Bitcoin is the decentralized distributed network, which is fundamentally different to the way the banking system works. Nobody decides when to print more money, how much to distribute, but interestingly, that means nobody's looking at fraud either. Now for the security aspect, Bitcoin uses what is known as SHA-256, and this is a hashing function. Now there is a fundamental difference between hashing and encryption. Hashing is one way, whereas encryption can be then decrypted. If I put my name through encryption, it would start on one end, go through to a bit of gobbledygook and then could be decrypted on the other end and reinterpreted. But with hashing, because it's one way, it goes through the hash and then it can't be reversed. And the way that this works is that you have to then match up and try and generate all the same information on the other side using private keys and public keys. And then it makes sure and checks that these two hashes then match and that's how that becomes then a successful transaction. So that's an overview of Bitcoin, crypto and blockchain. 
but let's have a look at some of the problems and challenges ahead. So firstly, it has to be mentioned, which is the bubble and the hype around the cryptocurrency. Bitcoin is worth over a staggering $60,000. In, in a few months from filming this video, it might be worth over 100,000 or it may have crashed again. We just don't know. There is lots of hype around Bitcoin, but the reality is we need to see Bitcoin being used in the everyday environment by lots of big companies. Now, Visa, MasterCard, Tesla, and some other big companies are starting to accept and use Bitcoin, but we need to see it used more widely and more integrated within society to really see it reflected in the prices that it currently is. Bitcoin is still in its infancy and we really need to understand how is it going to mature and settle down. And then that's when I think we'll start to see a fair and true value of the cryptocurrency. And if I was going to be paying back a friend one pound or one dollar for a simple coffee, then I'm gonna to have to pay them back 0.000016 Bitcoin. That's not an easy number to compute if you then start adding up the pounds and pennies. So a big challenge of Bitcoin in the future if the value does stay high, how do we normalize an amount to pay people? Otherwise the transactions are going to be incredibly confusing and not very human friendly. Secondly is the regulation and governmental control. Now, typically a lot of the financial systems are all run by their own governments in the country. But because Bitcoin isn't a central government and it's not a private company, it's this open source thing that exists on the internet, there's no way of really controlling it and governments and financial institutions don't like that. However, some countries like Japan, China and Australia are starting to introduce some form of regulation around the currency, which gives them a little bit more control and power and the ability to tax people. There is this natural fear around losing the control of your own currency or economy because banks and governments have to work closely to ensure that economies don't collapse essentially. And they're uncomfortable with the fact that there is this big decentralized thing that they can't own or have any control of. And that is scary for them. So it's going to take a massive, massive culture shift for a lot of big economies and established countries to really get their heads around how Bitcoin can be fully integrated within society. And you've got to remember that because governments can't control this this currency, then they have no ability to completely control their own economy. The way that economies are run in each country is that banks either print less money or they print more money. And this is what causes inflation and the distribution of difference between different currencies in the world. But if governments and central banks can't do this, then how do they control their own economy in, for example, when times get tough. If you think about the virus, the US have been giving loads of stimulus checks out, the UK government have been doing loads of furlough schemes and making sure that everybody is supported, but how do you do that when you can't just magically create more Bitcoin? And while it is still all unregulated, do you really want to put all of your money, all of your savings, your pension, everything you've got into Bitcoin and store it within Bitcoin rather than your local currency? For me, I think I'd rather wait a little bit just to see how it matures. Next is the purpose of Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin was the first cryptocurrency out in the market, and that means that the technology behind Bitcoin is limited and has its limitations. There are newer and better and greater ideas coming out into the crypto market now with different coins and different technologies. For example, Bitcoin can store 2,400 transactions in a single block. The more blocks there are, the more processing there is. In comparison, Visa processes around 1,700 transactions every single second, but they have the capacity to store up to 21,000 transactions every single second. So Bitcoin does not have the capacity to get to those kind of levels where they can start to dominate Visa or MasterCard. And because there is this lower capacity, it means that Bitcoin do charge a higher fee to send payments, which actually isn't a very good deal when you look at, for example, payments in the United Kingdom, where sending a faster payment between bank to bank is completely free. So why would I then move to Bitcoin? when I have to pay quite high fees to move money and send money to a friend. Ethereum is definitely one to watch. It's still a cryptocurrency and it still uses the blockchain. However, there's a fundamental difference where Ethereum uses what is known as smart contracts. A smart contract doesn't just track transactions like Bitcoin does, it actually programs them. This means that you could set up a smart contract with a company or investment firm or pension fund to decide what to do with your money and how to process it and where to put it and what to do. This means you could spend, save and invest your Ethereum all without touching it because a central company that you would authorize would do that all for you. And bearing in mind that this can be used on money, stocks, property, it's just starting to be used by big institutions because the whole idea of a smart contract is a really fascinating piece of technology that is really in its infancy. Barclays are already using Ethereum smart contracts to trade derivatives. It's also being used by ING Bank as well and also Ubisoft Games. There are loads of companies starting to take on board this style of technology. And with Bitcoin struggling at 10 million transactions 
transactions every single month, other technologies like Ethereum might start to overtake it in the future. So unless we see Bitcoin really start to take off within the actual day-to-day -day economy and spending and with companies, it really isn't going to reflect its price. It's the complete opposite of a company like Apple, for example, which have the biggest market cap in the world for companies. They are constantly innovating. They're pushing out way more products. Loads of people use Apple every single day from a phone to an iPad to a MacBook to a Mac Mini. Whatever it is, they have a very visible and tangible product and business, but Bitcoin isn't quite there yet. The next bit is money laundering and crime. Now, the rough way Bitcoin works is that you have a private key and a public key, but nothing is tied to your name. So even though you can view every single Bitcoin transaction that's ever happened, you have no idea who that person is unless they tell you, this is my Bitcoin public key and this is my name. This has meant that it's a very, very easy way for all fraudsters and crime bosses to put loads of money into Bitcoin transfer that money across the world, launder it, and then bring it back into local currencies. And that means historically Bitcoin has been a bit synonymous with crime and illicit activities. It's also this syndication with crime that has stopped big organizations and central banks from really taking on Bitcoin into their economies because what they don't want to do is accidentally bring in millions if not billions of pounds of laundered money into their local economies. So that's why it needs some form of regulation and that's why banks are very scared of it. However, the narrative is changing. The majority of Bitcoin isn't used for criminal activities these days. Back in 2019, a report was done that showed that around 5% of Bitcoin transactions were crime related. However, the narrative is changing. Bitcoin is being used less and less for crime. In a report in 2021 by Chain Analysis, they found in 2019, just over 2% of Bitcoin transactions were used for illegal and illicit crime activities, which equated to over 21 billion pounds. Criminal share fell to around 0.34%, which equates to around over $10 billion. Now that's still a lot of money, but it's definitely decreasing year on year. And another challenge is energy and the environment. Now, when Bitcoin was very, very new and the first blockchain had been mined, anybody could go onto their normal laptop and mine some Bitcoin using their general laptop processing power and built-in graphics card to mine some of those blocks and get some Bitcoin as rewards. But as more blocks become mined, those algorithms become more and more complex and therefore require more and more computing power to be able to crack each block and mine it open. Therefore, it then went from laptops to people having custom built gaming systems with dedicated graphics cards. And then again, as it got more and more popular, more blocks have been mined. These days you need very expensive hardware kits that are custom built for crypto mining to be able to make any kind of money back and actually mine the current blocks because those algorithms and hashes are now so complex. But this means mining Bitcoin isn't really beneficial anymore because the cost of the energy and the electricity that you put into mining it probably isn't worth the amount that you're going to get back these days. When you think about a Bitcoin mining company over in California, think about the summer when it's very hot and very warm, they're also gonna to have to pay for cooling the entire system and warehouse that they have as well. And lastly, I wanted to share my own thoughts about Bitcoin, crypto and blockchain. Now, with Bitcoin specifically, I think it's a very exciting piece of technology. It's something that's brand new but it's definitely hyped up at the moment. When you look at the usage of Bitcoin, it's just not increasing year on year and does not warrant or justify the huge increases in prices. I think it's an interesting concept that's going to start. It depends where it's gonna go in the future. And I think for the moment, we should just enjoy the ride and enjoy a bit of profit before it might all come crashing down. The reality is, we don't really know. And we actually might look back at Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in 15 to 20 years time and wish that we would invest in now because this could be the next Google, it could be the next Amazon, Microsoft, Netflix, all these big companies that had really cheap stocks back in the day, 10, 15 years ago. And now we look back and wish that we could have been a part of that huge wave in the stock market. So who knows? Crypto, I think is here to stay. I think it's a very exciting industry and more and more could happen. I think if I was gonna be a betting man, that a newer technology like Ethereum may overtake Bitcoin in the future that has faster, better, and more useful technology than just being a payment processor. And if it is really to survive in the long term, we need to understand how it's going to mature and settle itself down into society. 
Could we really be using Bitcoin every single day? Who knows? It might just be a bit of a novelty and one thing that dies out over time. But I think the whole idea behind the blockchain is such a fascinating idea and such a new piece of technology that could be applied to so many different things outside of cryptocurrency. But of course, don't put all of your eggs into one basket. Make sure that if you are looking to invest in crypto, then make your own decision and do your own due diligence about the amount of risk that you want to take because stocks can go up and they can also go down. I personally wouldn't allocate all of my portfolio into crypto. I just do it a little bit, enjoy it for a bit of fun, but most of it is in more secure stocks and I'm moving some of that into property this year. If you're enjoying this video, you can check out loads of other great ones like this one on top here coming soon, which is my introduction to Ethereum, or you can check out the video on the bottom, which is property versus stocks versus crypto, which one is better. So feel free to choose one of these and I'll see you on the other side.